Hey friends, Dr. Randy Lane Buncher, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. Happy New Year. We're delighted you tuned into the broadcast today and we believe we have some things to share with you. They're going to be a great way for you to start this new year. Before we get into the broadcast, though, as always, we want to remind you of the resources we have free and available for you at randylanebunch.org. That's the Connecting Point Communications website. And under the media link, you'll find a plethora of resources free and available to you 24-7, our blog, our podcast, brand new edition of our magazine is there. We would love it if you would go and take advantage of those resources. Also, of course, our YouTube channel is there, and we would love it if you would go there, subscribe, like, and comment. That's a great blessing to us when our viewers do that. In addition to all of that, we would love to hear from you. If you would email us at info at connectingpc.org, we would love to receive your testimonies and praise reports. If God has somehow touched you through the viewing of this broadcast, we would really love to hear from you. Also, send us your prayer request. We love to stand in faith with you. Well, today we're going to begin talking about devoted to prayer. Uh, you know, I know that we're all making our New Year's resolutions and determining what we're going to do to make the coming year a better year than 2020. I don't think there's anybody that's sorry to see 2020 go. But I think oftentimes we think that just somehow a magical turn of the calendar is going to make everything different. And we know that if we don't do things that are different, we're not going to have necessarily a different year. We've all heard it before. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again, expecting different results, right? So we need to do something different. So I want to encourage you among the other things that maybe you're purposing in your heart to do in the coming year. I want to encourage you to make sure that you're diligent in your devotional life with the Lord and devote yourself to prayer. So we're going to read Paul's words. And I'm actually going to be teaching out of the NIV for this series simply because I like the consistency of the language that the New International Version gives us in this particular topic. So in Colossians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 2 through 4. And here the Apostle Paul says to the church at Colossae, Devote yourselves to prayer, be watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it as clearly as I should. Paul here is talking about the fact that prayer is essential to the missionary enterprise. And of course, we can see all throughout Paul's epistles, as we'll see down the road in this series, that Paul always solicited the churches for his prayers or for their prayers for his ministry. And you know, I think it's interesting, uh, Paul encourages a church here to be devoted to prayer. And we're always looking to the early church, that first century church as a model, as an example, because we know that within a very relatively short period of time, they turned the world upside down with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so oftentimes we look to them as a model. What did they do to make them so effective? You think about it, how, how powerful is it that within 300 years of Jesus' resurrection, the church had essentially covered and conquered the Roman Empire. Uh, I mean, obviously we know that maybe it wasn't such a great thing that Christianity became the state uh, church in the early 300s. But nevertheless, if you think about it, a movement started by an itinerant preacher in the backwater province of Judea, covered and conquered the Roman Empire in just somewhat around 300 years. And so it's good for us to look to the early church and what they did to make such a powerful beginning of the movement of Christianity throughout the world. So what was the engine that drove that? Well, an engine has a lot of moving parts, and I think we make a mistake when we try to pin the success of the early church on just one particular aspect of what they did. But one thing we can see without question that they did, and they did diligently, was that they devoted themselves to prayer, just like the Apostle Paul encouraged the church at Colossae to do. So let's take a look at some of the verses in the book of Acts early on, where we can see the church devoting themselves to prayer. Let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 14. This is before the day of Pentecost, when the New Testament um, era, you might say, was inaugurated by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But here they are gathered in this upper room, still kind of for fear of the Jews, praying as God had directed them to do. And we see here in Acts 1.14, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I laugh sometimes because, of course, we know that if you look at the early ministry of Jesus, his mother and his brothers weren't always a part of his entourage. For a while, there was somewhat of a separation there, and even his brothers did not believe in him until he was raised from the dead. We know that he appeared to James, uh, his brother, and uh, obviously Mary and the brethren of Jesus are here. And I think it's kind of funny because here's Jesus inaugurating the church. And, you know, I've planted churches before, and usually when you plant a church, you at least get your family, right? And so Jesus has got his family. He's got a handful of disciples, 120 all told. And what are they devoting themselves to? What are they giving themselves to? They're giving themselves to to times of prayer. I remember when the Lord led me to go plant a church in New England, and uh, he began to telegraph his intent for our ministry early on. And so 
almost a year, uh, I'd say a good three quarters of a year before we even moved to New England to start that church, we were meeting every night and praying and believing God uh, to pave the way, to open doors, uh, you know, to cause the obstacles to be removed. We were praying diligently for the Lord to go before us and pave the way so that we'd be a success in our endeavor. And so that's exactly what they did. They were constant in prayer. And friend, if we have things we want to see launched, if we have enterprises for Christ that we want to see be successful, we need, like the early church, to be constant in prayer so that as it launches, it launches in the power of the Spirit. Let's look after the day of Pentecost now in Acts chapter 2, verses 42. They've had the great day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls uh, came to Christ. I'm sure a lot of that was as a result of their prayers in that upper room before the day of Pentecost came. But now the church is beginning to organize itself a little bit. They have some house churches. They're also meeting collectively. And we pick this up in verse uh, 42 of Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Now, I want you to notice the things that the church was giving themselves to. It says they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. That's what we're doing right now. We're teaching the Word of God. And to fellowship. It's what local churches do. They have times of fellowship, getting together, whether it's potlucks or just fellowshipping before or after a service. And then not only that, but the breaking of bread, which could be eating together, but also the Lord's table, and to prayer. So what did they devote themselves to? Teaching of the Word of God, fellowship, getting together to commemorate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and His wonderful redemption He secured for them, and to pray. And so the early church was devoted, among other things, to prayer. Let's take a look at another verse, Acts chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. We really want to land on verse 4, but this is a particularly important passage because this was a pivotal moment when it would have been easy for the church to sacrifice what's most important for lesser priorities. And oftentimes, I think this is what happens to churches, to ministries, even to individual believers' lives, when instead of making the main thing the main thing, we get distracted by putting out a lot of little fires, by getting busy with the business that others are basically trying to load us down with, rather than giving our priority to the things that are most important. So in Acts chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So here we have this wonderful passage where, with great discretion and wisdom, the apostles address a growth problem. You know, it's wonderful when a church grows, but with growth comes growth pains. And so they're experiencing some growth pains. And now there's a little bit of even racial division creeping into the church because the Greek-speaking Jews are feeling like the, Hel the, uh, the Hellenistic Jews are feeling like the Hebraic Jews are dis you know, kind of like dissing their... Um, and marginalizing their widows and kind of like, you know, just putting them to the side and taking care of their own people and not really taking care of these Greek-speaking widows in the daily distribution of food. So there's contention. So what do people do when there's contention? They come to the leadership and say, what are you going to do about it? You know, I think it's interesting. There was 12 apostles, and yet there's a multitude of disciples by this time. There's 3,000 that came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. When the man was raised up at the gate, beautiful in Acts chapter uh, uh, 3, there was another 5,000 that came to Christ. So we're talking about a church potentially of 10,000 people or more. And yet all those people are looking to 12 men to fix all their problems. And then I love what the apostles said, look out among yourselves. In other words, can't you guys do something? <laughs> they said, we're not going to take ourselves away from what God's called us to do, to give ourselves to things that others could do very handily if we would just delegate this responsibility to them. We're going to give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So when the opportunity came to be distracted from their primary purpose and their calling, they refused to allow um, other people's problems to become their problem. They said, no, we're going to delegate these responsibility and we're going to give ourselves to prayer. I think, you know, particularly in our day, we can become very naturally and carnally minded and think that we're not really doing anything if we're not occupied with a lot of busyness. Even in the ministry, this happens, where people feel like if they're not doing a lot of activity, a lot of industry, uh, that they're not really being, um, you know, engaged in something profitable. It's kind of a scenario I heard one Bible teacher give one time, maybe a husband or a wife come home and they call out for their spouse, hey, what are you doing in there? Well, I'm just spending a little bit of time in prayer with the Lord. Well, if you're not doing anything, come out here and help me. <laughs> Too often times, we find this attitude very prevalent in the lives of believers that if you're praying, you're really not doing anything. You can do that anytime. I remember a friend of mine shared with me a story 
he became friends with a man by the name of Husto. And Husto was an apostle of God. He had planted a number of churches down in Mexico. He had once been a member of the Mexican mafia. And God had radically saved him. And he was being used of God to plant churches throughout uh, Mexico. And my friend went over to visit him one day because they lived in a neighboring community. And so he came into Husto's house. And his wife said he's in the back room in prayer. So my friend came and kind of respectfully slowly entered the room. And he saw that Husto was face down in the carpet praying. And my friend, you know, we were young in ministry at this time, and he said, well, at any moment, he'll acknowledge that I'm here, and he'll, you know, quit praying and talk to me. And he said he waited a little bit, and Husto just kept praying and kind of blowing him off. He obviously knew he was in the room, but he didn't seem to care. And so he just continued to uh, pray, Husto. And so finally, my friend um, sensed just a holy, reverent presence in that room, and he realized God is here. And then it dawned on him, he's talking to somebody more important than me. And sometimes I think, you know, again, we become so carnally minded, we think if we're not engaging with people, if we're not running around taking care of people's needs, and, you know, basically being chief cook and bottle washer for what everyone wants us to do, that we're not doing something valuable. But friend, there's nothing more important than the business of prayer. If we want to accomplish things with heaven's help, we have to draw on heaven's resources to do that. I have said for years that I believe that I, I believe one of the uh, presumptions that heaven must resent the most is this idea that somehow the work of heaven can be done in the arm of the flesh. It cannot be done in the arm of the flesh. It must be done in the power of the Spirit. I know a lot of times the pastor is being called upon to be more like an executive or administrator or even a counselor. And, you know, according to his gifts, he might serve in some or even all of these things, but that's not his primary responsibility. His primary responsibility as a shepherd, which is exactly what the word pastor means. In fact, the Greek word poimen is translated both pastor and shepherd. And his primary responsibility is to both feed and to lead the flock of God. And I'm telling you, you cannot do that without prayer. You know, my wife will tell you, I spend the lion's share of my life reading, praying, studying, preparing, so that I have something on the inside of myself to give to other people. And yet, for all of that study, for all of that preparation, for all of that time in the Word and other resources so that I can learn and have a heart full, a reservoir of truth to uh, communicate to others, if I'm not prayerful, if I'm not seeking God, if I'm not asking Him, Lord, what is it you want me to do? I have nothing to offer people on a Sunday or a Wednesday night or in this broadcast or any other time. I am so dependent upon the power of the Spirit of God to enable me to communicate, even to know what to preach. And so, friend, it is a supernatural enterprise that we're involved with. And so we must give ourselves to the work of God. You know, talking about pastors, I just kind of humorously remember a pastor saying one time that, you know, he was very idealistic when he started off into the ministry. And he didn't realize all the demands people were going to put on him and all the pressure he was going to feel being in that role. And he said, you know, when I first started off as a pastor, I thought God gave us that shepherd's rod to gently guide and protect the flock. He said, after being in ministry for a few years, I realized God gave me that stick for self-defense. <laughs> but the point is that oftentimes prayer is not occupying the place in our lives that it should. What did Paul tell the church at Colossae? Devote yourselves to prayer. What did the early church do? They devoted themselves, among other things, to prayer. And what should we do? We should do the same thing. If we're going to follow the model the early church gave us, then we need to devote ourselves to prayer so that God's supernatural help, that help from heaven, can empower us to do what God has called us to do. Of course, ultimately, we look to Jesus. He is our ultimate example, and we have no better example than Jesus himself. And so we want to take a look for a moment at his prayer life as well. After all, that's what discipleship is about. Uh, the word disciple means a learner, but literally it means an adherent, someone who hears and does what the master teaches. And after all, Jesus said, why call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? And so let's take a look for a moment at the life of Jesus, his prayer life, and the role that, play, uh, that prayer played in his success. Mark 1, 35, listen to this verse. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. I think this addresses two excuses right here. I'm always hearing people say, you know, I just don't have time to pray. I've got other things going on, Brother Andy. You just don't understand. No, you have time for what you want to have time for. I have people all the time who will tell me, maybe we have a meeting coming up, a revival, a special seminar, series of meetings with a guest speaker. Oh, brother, I wish I had time. But those same people could get concert tickets to their favorite band, and they'll fly across the country, make special arrangements to be there for that concert. No, we have time for what we want to have time for. And Jesus, I don't think you're going to find anybody busier than him. In fact, John says at the end of his gospel that if all the things Jesus done had been recorded, that the world itself could not contain the books 
that would be written. Now, that might be a little bit hyperbole, but the fact of the matter is Jesus got some stuff done in three and a half years of public ministry. So you're not going to prove to me that you're busier than Jesus. And yet, what Jesus? What did Jesus do? Just to put it in our uh, vernacular today, he just set his alarm a little earlier. He just got up a little bit earlier to do the business of prayer because he recognized he's dependent on the Father's help. Now, you know, we might ask the question, why would God need to pray? Jesus is God, right? Why would he need to pray? Well, because he humbled himself and became a man. And in doing so, he partook in, of some of the same limitations you and I have partaken of. For example, the Bible said God cannot be tempted. Neither, uh, God does not tempt anyone, neither can he be tempted. And yet Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Uh, God cannot grow or learn. He's omniscient. And yet Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. So Jesus partook of some of the limitations that we experience as human beings because he emptied himself of his divine privilege to identify with us. It did not mean that he ceased to be God. He was God, is God, always shall be God. But he laid aside some of those privileges that he had so that he could identify with you and I so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest. And so he recognized how dependent he was upon the Lord. So he just got up, or upon the Father, I should say. So he just got up a little bit earlier, set his alarm a little bit earlier so that the business of the day did not distract him from the primary business of developing intimacy with God, cultivating a relationship with the Lord, and drawing on, heaven, re, uh, drawing on heaven's resources. I remember uh, one of my leaders in the first church that I pastored, we had a tremendous uh, prayer ministry in our first church. I mean, we were praying, 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 and I could go on and tell you about a tremendous season of prayer that God placed me in at that season of my life that was just outstanding. I've never had really another season of prayer probably as uh, engaged as I was during that time. And we had a great revival as a result of it. But at that time, I was a young pastor, pastoring a relatively small church, but I was paid full time to do it. So my responsibilities did not overwhelm me. So I was able to give myself to literally hours of prayer a day. And there would be days where I would pray three, four, and five hours a day. And it's not because I was so super spiritual, but if you'll give yourself to the practice of prayer, you'll find out that you can pray more and more and more. Just like with anything you do, you get more acclimated to doing it. It becomes a practice of your life. And particularly with prayer, I just found it more and more valuable and necessary for me to pray. Charles Finney, uh, the great revivalist of the 1800s, would give himself to long seasons of prayer in the morning hours. And he said something to this effect, that if I lost the spirit of intercession for even a moment, that I was ineffectual as a soul winner. So again, that dependency that we have on prayer. Well, one of my church leaders was wanting to pray more. He had a full-time job. He had an auto body shop that he ran. And so he was a busy man. And plus he had responsibilities in the church as well. But he had been asking the Lord, Lord, I want you to wake me up in the morning hours to pray. I want you to, you know, use me for the purpose of prayer. Lord, I know that sometimes you're looking for a man, someone to stand in the gap and intercede. I want to be one of those minute men that you can call on at a moment's notice to pray out your will, your plan, your purpose in the earth. So he made that commitment. Well, the Lord took him up on it. And he said, I knew it was the Lord when he would do it because I'd wake up in the morning at 4 a.m., an hour or so before his alarm would go off. And he said, my eyes would pop open like they're on springs. And he said, I'm wide awake. He said, but at the same time, this is up in the northern Sierra Mountains and it's cold and the fire stoked and going and it's toasty, you know, and he, underneath the blankets. And man, I don't want to get out in that cold living room and, uh, I, you know, have to stoke the fire and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So he'd just roll back over in bed. Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that call tomorrow. Well, he kept doing that. The Lord kept waking him up and he kept kind of blowing it off. Occasionally he would pray, sometimes so he'd sleep in. And one morning in particular, sure enough, his eyes popped open like they were on springs at 4 a.m. And he said, oh, Lord, I just don't want to do it. He rolled over and went to sleep. The moment he went to sleep, he had a dream. And in this dream, uh, he heard a knock on the door. Now, he did not realize it was a dream. He thought he was actually doing this. He thought he rolled over and heard a knock on the door, but he was actually dreaming. And so he jumps out of bed, runs to the door, opens the door, and he said there was a middle-aged woman standing there. He said she was very attractive. He, he, the word he used was handsome, a very handsome woman. Uh, but about, you know, middle-aged, and she smiled at him so sweetly and said, excuse me, but didn't the Lord just wake you up to pray? <laughs> and he said, uh, well, yeah, he did, but you know, we're going to be going to pastor's house a little bit later in the morning and having a corporate prayer time, and she just so sweetly shook her head and said, yes, but haven't you been asking the Lord to wake you up a little bit earlier in the morning so you can pray about other issues, personal matters that you want to bring before the Lord? Well, he tried another excuse, and this lady just so sweetly countered that excuse. And one by one, she just took down one excuse of his after another. And finally, he thanked her. He closed the door, and instantly he woke up from his dream, and it was 4.15. <laughs> so God has a way of calling us out on those commitments that we make to pray. 
But needless to say, Jesus was devoted to prayer so that if he needed to, just got up a little bit earlier in the morning to take care of the business of heaven. And friend, if we want God to be involved with the rest of the hours of our day, we need to invite him. We need to make sure we're devoted to prayer so that we're drawing on heaven's resources, uh, taking advantage of the wisdom that he can minister to us. But again, if we're not inviting him into our world, if we're not inviting him into our lives through prayer, if we're not making ourselves available so we can pray out the purposes of God, we shouldn't be surprised when they're not happening and when we're running into frustrations and roadblocks. Let's look at another passage of scripture where Jesus gives himself to prayer. We're going to look at, uh, look at chapter uh, 5 of Luke's gospel. This is Luke 5, 15, and 16. And this was during one of the occasions of a great ministry time. It says here in Luke 5, 15, and 16, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And uh, this was after Jesus had healed a leper and the news about him is, you know, being broadcast hither and thither. And, and the crowds are beginning to come and, and he's more attention and more spotlight is being placed on him. But I love the fact that Jesus did not let that go to his head, stayed small in his own eyes. And often he withdrew to lonely places. He got alone with God and prayed. There's something about prayer that helps keep you grounded, that helps keep you centered, that helps keep, keep you in heaven's perspective to where we're dependent upon, acknowledge our dependency upon God. Friend, one of the best advices I can give you if God is blessing your ministry is don't believe your own press. Never forget whom you're dependent upon. Never forget whom your source is. And Jesus stayed very connected to the Father and recognized that he was his source because he was constantly going to a solitary place where just he and the Father could get together and he could wait on him and minister to him and draw on heaven's resources. Uh, let's look at one or two more before we close today. Let's go to Luke chapter 6. Uh, Luke chapter 6. We're going to look here at verses 12 and 13. And this is a very important passage of scripture. And I think we would all do well uh, to take the advice here. Luke uh, 12, uh, I'm sorry, Luke uh, chapter 6 verses 12 and 13 says, one of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So this is when Jesus is, again, in our vernacular, choosing a staff. I wonder how many times people have undermined the success of their own ministries by being presumptuous in their staff choices, by hiring an associate or a music minister or, or having volunteers come into the church that ended up undermining the authority of leadership, that ended up causing strife and contention simply because they were not mindful and prayerful about who they were working with in their ministry. You know, the Bible, of course, tells us not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but sometimes even believers are not equally yoked because they have two different visions. What, does it, what do you have when you have two different visions? You have division. And oftentimes there's division simply because pastors are not mindful and prayerful about whom to have helping them in the work of the ministry. So Jesus is having to determine, okay, who's going to carry this thing on after I fulfilled my purpose here on the earth, been crucified, raised from the dead, and ascend to heaven? Who's going to follow me up? Who's going to carry the early church and be its leadership? These are crucial decisions that he's making, and he doesn't make them without spending adequate time in prayer. Again, Jesus is God, and though he's a man and identifying with you and I, he still has a wisdom probably that most of us would not have. Uh, he has obviously you know, a sinless character. I'm sure he can see and have discernment into the minds and hearts of men far more clearly than any of us could. And yet still, he's so dependent upon the Father, he spends all night in prayer before he decides who these staff members of his are going to be to carry the church in that first leg after he's raised from the dead. Let's look at one or two more and then we'll close for today and we'll come back. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we're going to look here at another instance of Jesus praying. Actually, two verses in Luke 9 verse 18, then we're going to jump down uh, to verse 28. Here it says, once when Jesus was praying in private, his disciples were with him. He asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? What I want you to see in this little verse is that Jesus prayed with the disciples around. In other words, he was a living example of, of a prayer life in front of these guys. He was not praying just always alone and quietly. He would pray with them in his presence. I think it's beautiful. I'll, I'll never forget one time uh, I was driving in my car with my young son and I was just praying in other tongues, praying in the spirit quietly. And my son, he was actually my oldest son, but he was very young at the time. He's hearing me pray in tongues. And all of a sudden I noticed him look up at me uh, in the passenger seat. He wasn't yet filled with the spirit, although he was filled with the spirit some years later. But he was listening to me pray in tongues. And then all of a sudden, you know, just a little kid, he begins to look forward and just under his breath. And he wasn't praying in the spirit, but he was trying to imitate daddy. 
What a beautiful picture. And here's Jesus modeling prayer for the disciples. Let's look down at verse 28 also. It says, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, and John with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. Now, this is when Jesus was transfigured before their eyes. But why did he take them to the top of the mountain to pray? You know, today we have a lot of gatherings for conferences. We have a lot of teaching gatherings uh, we have gatherings for all kinds of purposes, but very few organizations, ministries, churches gather together just to pray anymore. You know, we used to always have Wednesday prayer meeting at the church, but nowadays churches just have another service. If they even have a midweek service at all, much of the time they just have a Sunday morning service. You come get a quick snack and you're back left on your own. But it used to be that people would meet together just to pray. The early church did. Paul told the Colossians to do it. And here, of course, Jesus was doing that with his inner circle on his staff as well. Pastors, I can't think of a better thing to do with your staff than to take them away sometimes, take them up on a spiritual mountain, as it were, to spend some time in prayer so that you all get on the same page one with another. I think it's no wonder, as we come to the last of these verses today that we're going to look at, that the disciples eventually ask Jesus how to pray. So in Luke chapter 11, notice what we read here, beginning with verse 1. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Now, of course, Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer is a little bit more extended. We can learn great principles of prayer from that. But I just want you to see that the disciples didn't ask Jesus, how do you do miracles? How do you do those signs and wonders? Could you teach us to do that? He did appoint them to do that, and they did that. But what they asked him about was his prayer life. Why? Well, obviously, because they saw that to a great degree, this was the engine that kept him grounded, that kept him plugged into the power of God. Friend, I can't think of anything better for us to commit to do as we launch into 2021 than to commit to pray. Again, if we want a better year than what we had in 2020, let's do something different. I dare say that many of us have allowed our prayer life to kind of lag behind. Other priorities have taken precedent. And nothing is more important than your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, your relationship with the Father. And of course, the way we nurture that is through prayer. There's all kinds of prayer. There's the prayer of petition, the prayer of faith, the prayer of intercession, giving thanks and praise. We could go on and on and talk about different kinds of prayer. But at the same time, you're going to learn how to pray by praying. You know, I learned how to drive when I was in high school because we had a high school class that was driver's training. And we went in and we learned from some books. We learned all the laws. We learned the rules. But you know what? They didn't leave it with that. They put us behind the wheel. In fact, they kind of put a warning sign on that car, driver's training, so that everybody could kind of get off the streets when we came coming. Why? Because they knew that just because we learned some stuff out of the book didn't mean we knew how to drive. And friend, just because you know what the Bible has to say, or you know a few verses about prayer, doesn't mean you're effective in your prayer life yet. You need to get behind the wheel. You need to start to pray. Where do I start? Well, start with what Jesus said. Hallowed be thy name. Begin to give God honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving. Go ahead and make your petitions to him. And you might find that God begins to direct and lead you in your prayer life. We'll give you some practical advice later. But right now, I want to encourage you to begin to pray. Friend, let me ask you, do you know Jesus? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? If you don't know Jesus, why don't you call on him right now? Why don't you just say, dear Jesus, I believe you died on Calvary's cross for me. I believe that you died to pay the penalty for my sins. Lord Jesus, would you come into my heart? Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I receive you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I would love to hear from you. Would you email me at info at connectingpc.org? We would love to hear from you. We love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next time on Connecting Point. Mm -hmm.